It's Kubrick's Universe, the Stanley Kubrick Podcast. Twenty twenty, the year that took years and took years off our lives, and with terrible sadness and personal grief not lost to those of us in Kubrick's Universe, years away from far too many souls. 2020. That was the year that sucked. 2020. The year we avoided contact. Your friends at our humble podcast have had difficulty keeping up with providing new episodes, but not because of a shortage of great interviews or content but because of the very same things most everyone listening has had to contend with. Because unforeseen circumstances and survival itself got in the way. In fact, we've had some fascinating interviews and great conversations with Kubrick scholars, collaborators, and fans during 2020. We are hanging on to them, archiving them, and working on getting them out to you just as soon as we can. In the past few years, the Kubrick's Universe team has put out a year in review edition cultivated by our research. This time around, we're here to say, and now for something completely different. If 2020 was many, unprecedented things. It was also the year of remote video conferencing, the year of Zoom. Enter our intrepid Mark Lentz, media maestro and man of many kind deeds. Mark, along with two of the greatest and coolest Kubrick scholars, James Marinaccio and James Sherman, stepped up and orchestrated a very cool and brand new concept for us, the Kubrick Hour on Zoom as a way to keep enthusiasts connected during the most difficult year any of us can remember. So we present this unique concept and approach for us to our year in review episode for this go around. What you're about to hear is the result of Mark and James's efforts to orchestrate a virtual roundtable discussion of the year in Kubrick News. 2020, with a moderated group of venerated enthusiasts. For this episode, we were privileged to have discussion among John Harrig, Mike Media Man, Mark McKinnon, Jorge Albaran Riquelme, Ian Roscow, Anne Strauss Wider, Max Rendon, Maria, Jerry First, and our very own and very lovable Stephen Rigg. We hope you enjoyed this new idea. We're proud of it. Just remember, if you're on a Zoom call with a Kubrick fan whom you've never met before, and you feel put on the spot when they ask you, well, what's your favorite food then? Simply reply, French fries and ketchup, and you'll get along just fine.
right. Well, I guess we'll get started. So, yeah, this is our year in review, and the format is uh, James Sherman is going to read through the events of the year, and if you have a story that goes along with that event, uh, please share it at that time. So, actually, uh, Stephen and I, uh, in January, we brought on some new mods to SCOS, and James Robert Sherman is one of them. And uh, they've really helped us a lot, uh, incredibly so. So we want to thank them. And and James, also thank you for being such a reliable and cheerful co-host to this event. Uh, any thoughts about being a mod now uh, in SCOS? Um, definitely kills the time in between my work meetings. So I see that as a positive thing. Okay. Uh, no, and, and just the exposure that I've had, you know, being a mod also being in on these meetings and stuff like that. And it's like the exposure to the different ideas, uh, that I had not even realized. I, I point out only because Ian's most recent influence on me, but, uh, Ian's comments about the shining have just like, like strat just blew my mind. It has like changed completely the way I look at the movie, the shining, which I loved even before that and it's interesting that i saw a lot of things that 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 he'd mentioned that i had seen before but i had never made the connections and so the thing is is that's just one element but it's great really what's fun is the saturday meetings and meeting you guys you guys have been great everybody here so yeah that's it's been fun you know part of a group part of a team well, thanks, yes, thank James. You. Thank you, James, from, <laughs> from uh, Stephen here. Uh, yeah, it's been fantastic that uh, I've been able to spend less time moderating SCAS. Uh, quite, well, I've been winding down, actually, the last few years from being the only admin and the only member back in 2011 uh, yeah. to getting up to 20,000 uh, and, and basically James joining me back in about 2012 very early on was James and, and be, so now being able to get Mark helping us and and you James and uh, Stephen, I was mention, Steve I was to mention real quick I'm sorry I believe I am the only person who has a Kubrick Scoss hoodie remember you, you <laughs> sold me one of those and then you had to stop I don't know how many you sold two was two and the yeah other I have the other one Mark, I have the a, other one the baseball shirt the Scots oh, really? baseball shirt. Yeah, no, and I have. The, I don't even wear it, dude. I mean, it's in my closet, like with plastic over it. So I make sure. I mean, it's like yeah. I'm keeping it forever. You it's know? a relic. It's absolutely a relic. Anyway, Steve, I'm sorry. I just yeah, but I do remember when I joined up. I can't remember receiving any money for those two uh, sweatshirts off you, <laughs> you guys bought. No, we paid them. We had to pay two, them. Might be two dollars waiting somewhere for me to collect <laughs> <laughs> for my commission. <laughs> Okay, what's next on the list here, Mark? Let's go down. Yeah, well, actually, the first item is the Envisioning 2001 exhibit opens at the Museum of the Moving Image. Um, so um, Barbara and uh, Wendell and uh, David Schwartz and Carl Goodman, this team has been uh, so welcoming to us in bringing this exhibition. And for us, it was really important to try to have Stanley Kubrick rec represented and recognized um, in New York. This is where he's from. The neighboring borough of the Bronx, of course, is where he grew up. Um, a lot of his early work was accomplished here as a photographer and as an emerging filmmaker. Um, the conversations with Arthur C. Clarke that happened around the development of 2001 happened in Manhattan when the family was living here. Um, and you can really see um, in the exhibition the dialogue that happened um, around this city. Um, and um, so, so for us to be back home here is fantastic. Um, the um, exhibition, the larger exhibition that Barbara referenced, the Stanley Kubrick um, touring show, has now been in 19 venues around the world. It has been seen by 1.8 million people. So this is a pretty remarkable statistic. And we think that uh, a lot of New Yorkers will be very interested in coming out and seeing this collection. We're very honored to always be working with the Stanley Kubrick estate, uh, represented today by Jonathan Cameron, who's here. Um, and of course, the family, Katarina Kubrick, is here with us. Um, very often, her uncle, Jan Harlan, who was uh, a producer in Stanley's team, and um, his, his brother-in-law, uh, is often with us. And unfortunately, he's in London and not able to join us today. But I do want to acknowledge him as a driving force to try to make sure that this exhibition comes to New York. 
Um, another interesting New York fact that Tim Hefner told me is that there was a warehouse in New York uh, where the test footage was done for the Stargate sequence. Um, so there's so many tie-ins to this film and this city. Um, the programming also that you'll have the advantage of having here in New York over the next six months is really rich and varied. We did a lot of this type of exploration when we hosted the exhibition um, in Frankfurt last year for the 50th anniversary. You can talk about Kubrick, you can talk about filmmaking, um, design, science fiction, um, technology, artificial intelligence, the future of our planet, uh, future of space travel. There are tremendous film programs looking at the influence on Stanley Kubrick of different earlier science fiction films and the films that came out of the work that he did. So uh, it's a really rich program and uh, we're honored to, uh, again, be here with these long-term partners and we hope, given that we have an exhibition space in Frankfurt that's quite similar in size, we think that over the years we can develop some projects together and be here more often and have some of the content that's created here delivered over to Europe. So uh, looking forward to all of that and thank you again for being here this morning. Now I happen to know that John mm -hmm. and maybe Mike and Mark have got to see it, I'm not sure, but let's weigh in with our impressions. Those of us who saw it before the virus hit. Is, is the exhibit still there? I wonder. I think it's still sitting there. Well, it's kind of, because they've been closed. Uh, they haven't been open for a year, you know, coming on a year now. They had a lot of uh, interesting artifacts that are just, um, you know, if they're still there. <laughs> John and I were there opening night, I think, in order to meet Katharina, who was attending the opening next screening of 2001. And I tell my little story. So I wanted some, I wanted Katharina to sign something for me. And all I could think of was I have this jacket at Kubrick, not the real one, but it's exactly like the one he wore at Barry Lyndon with the orange lining. And, uh, I think as soon as she glanced me with this with this jacket on, she thought I was a real nutty fan. <laughs> and she was also, so she kind all? of avoided my gaze. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> she was very hard pressed uh, because so many people were hounding her. But yeah, I wanted her to sign it with a marker, but I never felt the time was right. But John, you, of course, you knew Katharina from attending her drawing sessions. Yeah, um, I'm trying to think back that far. Uh, <laughs> let's see, there was, I, w I was actually there the day before too for the press briefing. Um, so we got a private tour beforehand and it was interesting to see how the exhibition had changed over a couple of days. Kind of like, they were kind of like trying to find the right spot. One of the things I remember was Katharina telling me that when they unboxed that chair, in the lounge for 2001. Like she just had to touch it and all the um, curators like, <gasps> don't touch it. But no, she, she had to touch it, you know, <laughs> to feel the fabric. But um, uh, what else? Yeah. So I remember Mark, we were trying to get, I didn't even get a chance. I just gave her like a bottle of uh, clockwork orange from uh, my hometown. There's a, there's a orange, uh, an orange liqueur called the uh, clockwork orange. I was like, Hey, here's this. Huh. And it was re really cool before she went up on stage because she had recognized me from uh, visiting her uh, ex well from visiting her her uh, art fair and uh, being a student of hers for oh just a brief weekend with her mother and um, before she went on stage well she like she gave me a hug because she was like she because she was she was busy like going around to different groups but like then like she just like she stopped all these people and like she ran up and she gave me a hug and it was really nice oh that's yay nice. that yeah. was great <laughs> but i didn't like i i knew mark wanted to get that sign but like i had a flight i think that night <laughs> i was like leaving out because i had to get like to south america but um i remember we we're trying to get that signed, and I didn't even have a chance to like give her my bottle until like the very last. I was like, "Oh, here, take this." And then someone else came up with others. Like everyone was like like giving her stuff. So I just said, "Okay, we'll have a good time. Thank you for coming." Uh, we were we were thinking of going. Well, she really likes Stephen Colbert, and I had gotten actually tickets to it. And she'd really like. She's like, "Oh yeah, if there's some way because I could ever like get in the Colbert show or something." And like, yeah. I, 
I don't have connections, but like your media contact, maybe she can figure out a way, but it was just like, you know, such a crazy time with the luck. I think uh, when I was there, it was um, uh, the mayor was on of New York, but it's the election season basically. So there wasn't a lot of time because they're, they were, they were doing the democratic debates uh, airing those live. And then he would go on. So it'd be like, there'd be no time for guests basically. Cause you had uh, Colbert commenting on the, on the democratic debates. But uh, yeah, I had invited her to go and it was funny because she couldn't, because they had already arranged for her to go see um, what was it? Uh, the To Kill a Mockingbird. She went to, she went to go oh, see Kill a Mockingbird. Oh, the play, the play. Yeah. Yeah. Cause she loves Ed Harris. So she went to go see that. I had, I had actually had tickets to see the next day, but uh, she went to go see that. And I was, it was funny when I was standing in line to go see Colbert that night, there were like two kids. I, I was thinking, oh man, she should have been here because the, there were two kids behind me. And one of was like, oh, like they're talking about like this really difficult situation. And he goes, you know, that's just like a clockwork orange. It's like, oh, have you ever seen clockwork orange? He goes, oh no. And so like they're having this like, <laughs> discussion <laughs> on clockwork orange. I'm thinking, man, she should have been here just to have like that random experience of like two people still talking about clockwork orange, you know, <laughs> this many years on. But, well, the exhibit looked great. But we had no time to really enjoy it. Dan Richter also gave a talk. Yes. It was great seeing him there amidst everything. And I know some of our SCAS members, or at least one of them, contributed to some of the models <laughs> that were used in it. We also got uh, the 2001 uh, book there when I was there. And uh, when I showed it to Dan Richter, he was like, oh, this is the book I wrote the, I wrote the uh, intro for. And he was like all excited. And did, did, did he was, sign it, John? Did he sign it? He signed mine, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was Simone and Filippo's, right? Yeah, that's the yep. book we gave them. Yep, yes. we were, we're we're trying so hard to get them to like stock that there for Filippo. Yeah, when he went through all that work, I don't think I don't think uh, anyone really got to see much of the exhibit the, with the um, pandemic. But I, I, how long do you think that was open for? Like a week or something? Oh, well, no, that was no, no. January, and I don't think it shut it was, to the end of February. Okay, so it was about a yeah, No, it was around March, Mark, when everything shut down in New York. And too. none of us got yeah. there before then. You know, and um, I went back once just to uh, – I love the Moviola, you know, the editing machine that they had. That was really special because that was the one that he did 2001 on, and uh, I really appreciated that. They also had some screenplays that were kind of um, you could page through them. They were on like a screen. Do you remember that? No, I didn't see it. Tell yeah, they had, they had like um, I think they had Napoleon, the screenplay for Napoleon, and it was also it was annotated. It was some like he had written some things, you know, on the pages. And um, you know, I have to. I wanted to go back and actually read the whole screenplay, but I never, you know, things. Um, I never had a chance to do that, but uh, it was an incredible exhibit. Actually, I hope it's still there. It would, um, especially this year because of the monoliths, the disappearance of all the monoliths. <laughs> yeah, we'll get to them at the end of the call. You know, I think there's some sort of connection here with everything. And, uh, oh, it is. It is. There is a connection. Well, I guess we should move on because we're Yeah, it's just sort of behind. sad that it kind of um, was aborted. I really think it would have grown in stature the longer it it kind of went on. And um, that's a real shame. Yeah, it would have been a big thing for them and us. One of the things we're proudest of in SCAS is Kubrick's Universe, which is produced by Stephen with Jason Furlong. And uh, they dropped a number of episodes of it this year. So we just want to mention them as they came out. And the first one, uh, was on Barry Lyndon to bring Leon Vitale and David Morley together again for the first time after the filming. They had never encountered each other since 1975, and we did it as a surprise. Hello. Hey, David. Hi. <laughs> hey, <what? clears throat> how are you doing? Good, man. How are you doing? It's Jason. Not too bad. Yeah, yeah. Cool. <laughs> I've got uh, yeah, I've, yeah. I've got Stephen on the line. Stephen Rig. Cool. I've got uh, James James Marinaccio. 
Hi there. Okay. Hi, James. Hello. And of course, I've got hi, Mark, Mark Lentz. Say hi, Mark. Hi, hi David. Mark. Hi there. Everyone okay over there? <laughs> yeah. 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 Cool, yeah. cool. Else? Yeah, I have. I, I do have one other person uh, uh, on the line with you, uh, but under no circumstances, David Morley, do I want you arguing with this man over a pencil. Leon, say hi. Oh dear, <laughs> David. <Leon. laughs> Good grief! Good grief! Oh my this God. is like a. Uh, this is uh, forty-five years, forty-five years on, or something. <laughs> yes, absolutely. isn't that insane? Yeah, That's insane. My, My God, God, how amazing! Well, you mean you, you're still an awkward little bugger, are you? <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> of course, I am. <laughs> and proud. Yeah, proud. Uh, Stephen, are you are you there? Yes. That, yes Any it, thoughts? It was a great uh, a great episode. Was that? Um, Episode thirty-two. Yes, it was. It was a great idea by uh, uh, Nick. Are we calling you Nick or James? <laughs> Nick's is easy. We got too many Jameses. Okay, Nick. <laughs> uh, yeah, great idea, and that episode worked out quite well. As yeah, it was. Um, it doesn't seem like a, a year ago. Was it January? Yes. Oh, yes. The twenty-sixth. Did anyone else on this call now hear that episode at all? Yes. Yes, I did. I think it was one of the shorter ones, wasn't it? I think it was only maybe a 30-minute episode, that. Yeah, it was, it was fantastic, that. It worked out really well, and it was great to hear Leon and David uh, being so surprised. Who arranged, right. uh, Stephen, did you arrange that? Were you, did you contact, like, uh, uh, David and... and and set up that or who uh, i was just curious i was just curious uh, well well james came up with the idea nick came up with the idea and uh <laughs> i think pretty much jason uh liaised with both leon and david uh, okay. yeah what we did was we had um a call similar to this we're doing right now where we had a whole bunch of people from the facebook group um for kind of a i think it was a year end uh kind of call and yes, it was. We we had, and then we had each person, we had Leon on the call, and we surprised everyone with um, having Leon talk to them. We didn't tell anybody that Leon Vitale was there, and we surprised each person. We talked to each per person separately, right? Is that how it did it? And then in, in each one of them, we said, oh, oh, there's somebody we want to introduce you to, and we put them on with Leon. So that you guys were arranging, and I, I just said, why don't we do, while we're doing this, why don't we have David and why don't we have surprise Leon with David? Yeah. Yes. And we made that and you made it into, into two different. Uh, That's kind right. of yeah. yeah so, but you added them in a separate shows, even though we kind of did those together. Yeah. So Leon, Leon uh, called, well, we called, we connected Leon with 10, 10, I think we had about 10 SCAS members on the call. So he spoke to them all individually. And then once we'd finished with the SCAS members, I think the final call in that, on that, uh, session was Leon calling David, speaking to David. Yeah, and then we split it into two episodes. So I guess uh, that was episode 32 where it was Leon and David. And then one of the um, next episodes was uh, Leon meets Skaz. Yeah, I was on that one. Uh, yeah, let's. So actually, we have a couple of these in a row. On January 26th, we had Gerald Freed. I was the third smallest kid in my high school. <laughs> Yeah, you get your growth because I never got past five eight. I'm five seven on a good day. Oh, good. That's why I like <laughs> you. Yeah. You get you're you're taller than me. You could probably still take me out with a, a one two punch. <laughs> uh, hey, I'm ninety <laughs> years old. I'm down to five foot three and a half now. It's coming. I know it's happening to me already. I I just turned forty eight. All right. Hey, All right. Is, I'm enjoying this. All right. Well, all these episodes are great. Uh, on 219, we did uh, a new book by Jeremy Shanofsky after Kubrick. And uh, it was a really fascinating discussion. What's the, what's, uh, the theme of his book? Film it's about Kubrick's influences on subsequent yeah. uh, filmmakers. Mm -hmm. 
which uh, Jeremy argues is very extensive. I think it's a collection of, yeah, it's a collection of essays, a lot of different contributors. And it's a really good, uh, again, another great episode. I described it as a box of chocolates for Kubrick fans. because It's just so much great stuff. Now, continuing on, uh, on March 6th, we did our 21st anniversary show I mean, of his passing. These are all pretty moving. I'm trying to remember how we did this one. I think we had a lot of quotes. Yeah, James found some quotes from 1999. Do you want to talk about that, James, how this show came about? Anniversary. This was the one where you got the quotes from the uh, news group. Oh, yeah. Oh, so this is back. This is that one? Right. This is back in 1999. I first got a computer and the internet in 97. So I was just learning. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> Yeah, you know, I wasn't. I think yeah, I was in the um, alt movies group, alt Kubrick movies. So back then, I was just videotaping everything to do with Kubrick. And 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 when I got the internet, I had already been doing that for years. When I got the internet, I, I started just copying things. And at one point, I said to myself, "Why the heck are you doing all this? What's going <laughs> on? What are you gonna do with this?" I just I have just this voice in my head that said, I don't know, maybe, maybe there'll be something good. <laughs> so there, I don't. There's a, another one aspect of stuff. My a lot of stuff I save that I'm hoping to use someday. I don't want to uh, spoil the story on that. But on this, we, I said to Stephen, I said, you know, I had when Cooper died, there were all these message boards and like forums and things like that, and I saved screenshots of pe- people just came on. And and made comments about their feelings about Kubrick passing, and I made a whole bunch of screenshots from it. So I, I said, "Why? Maybe you could do a show around that." Assuming Steve would say, "Oh, I don't know," and he, he said, "That's great." So we uh, just I wrote a little script from that, and we had a whole bunch of people. It was like you know Bob from Bob from Schenectady and Sven from Sweden, whoever the people were on these boards from 1999 we we read their comments but we got somebody to do each voice you could explain that part better we we actually found people from scas and other places to actually do the voices of so we had if we had 15 people we, that we were using their quotes we found 15 different voices right and we actually and we actually f- yeah. down one of the original people to do his ho- to do his own voice which is yeah, quite good. <laughs> uh, but, the, but the other 14 i can't remember if there were 15 uh however how many there were but everyone else we, we found people who uh could kind of emulate the original quarters based on their name if they sounded a little bit french if their name sounded a little bit like a French name, because in some cases we didn't know what part of the world they were from. So we'd found someone who had a bit of a French accent in SCAS to recreate that particular person who posted the original quote. Uh, I think there was a couple of uh, original quarters, uh, people who quoted on the uh, original message boards from Italy. So uh, Filippo, our Italian SCAS friend, uh, did it the voices for two of the Italian people. So that was one of my favourite episodes to work on, actually, because it was a real kind of uh, kind of a proper production, really, where we got almost actors to do voices and things, and it all came together. It was like uh, a BBC radio show, it felt like. Yeah, it was a really good show. It's a really good one to listen to. That's probably a good show to, uh, if, if ever anyone was going to start listening to a podcast, that's maybe one I'd, I'd point them at first, because it's a very... It's a, it's a very moving episode in itself, but it's also a nicely produced one. And yeah, great idea and well executed by us. I all. would say they're all very well produced. Uh, Stephen adds in a lot of music. He does a lot of work on them. And I, yeah. I always feel like I'm in Kubrick's universe for the duration of yeah. the podcast. It is, it's a, it is one of the best podcasts I've heard, Stephen. Seriously. On, what, on Kubrick or? 
just in general, I mean, I get a lot of podcasts, but it's like you guys put a lot of production. I mean, it's, I see the stuff in NPR, and it's like I don't think it's as well produced as your stuff. So I'm just saying. What, what's NPR? Yeah, the content. Um, is, uh, is National good, Public yeah. Radio does a lot of podcasts and stuff like that, and and there's you know, and, and like I said, they're supposed to be the benchmark here in in uh, in in America, and I think that the podcast you guys put together is is as good as any of I've heard. So wow, thank you. Yeah, that's just my feel. That's just my feel. Maybe because I'm biased, the the subject matter yes. is me more than a, you know. It's like you are, you I don't are automatically hear, engaged. Yeah, right. I don't want to hear about farming in Wyoming, so maybe I'm a little bit more you know, <laughs> focused. And, you know. I, I think I actually put because I'm kind of a a filmmaker who doesn't right. get the opportunity to make films. Um, I think I, I kind of use my filmmaking creativity in the podcast. It's a way I can get that kind of. Um, um, need to create yeah. i think so yeah so that's that's filled a nice creative gap for me as well as producing the uh the podcast be it only audio rather than visual as well yeah right right let's do two more uh in april and may so leon uh gave us an absolute ton of time and uh you guys talk with him forever he was extremely generous so this is the first of, uh, I think, well, we can have four episodes. Is that right, Stephen? Uh, what, from the Leon interview? Yes. Uh, I think it might be six or seven, actually. Wow. That, that's based on, we did, we did three calls. We did, we did the two marathon calls with him, which were about three and a half hours each. And then we did the follow-up one that um, we did for the Meet Skaz and Meets David Morley. So from the original seven hours, we've only put two episodes out. I think there's another five episodes from that original seven hours to come. I've, I've split them down into films. The first episode that we put out was all about film worker. The next episode was all Barry Lyndon. Um, I think that's all we've done. And then the next one's going to be him talking about The Shining, then about Full Metal Jacket, then about Eyes Wide Shut, and then a general one. So, yeah, that, what's that, seven, maybe seven episodes? And for someone who seems so shy in Film Worker, at the beginning of Film Worker, he's become a very good interview with all kinds of stories. Yes. Oh, yeah. Uh, we've got the rest of his episodes in the archive uh, so they're they're going to be coming out forever (laughs) (laughs) okay and then in May actually uh, Jason came along with me to that opening night premiere specifically to see Care to try to get him to uh, Jason did a lot of work to get Care to be on our podcast so this is the first uh Reward from all the work that Jason did is this great interview with Care. And it's before 2001. So it's Care talking about his career leading up to 2001. Also, he's a great interview. Uh, Stephen, any thoughts about this one? Yeah, we did that over two uh, sessions as well. That was just, um, we interviewed him on the phone, like we do with everyone. It's always on the telephone. Um, And that was in the early stages of uh, lockdown. Um, We did two sessions with him. Uh, Probably did maybe four or five hours again there um, of the two sessions. And uh, yeah, he was great to talk to. Um, He had some great stories. And I think he appreciated being asked at length about his career minus 2001 i.e everything else which we covered everything i mean we we didn't speak very long you know considering we spoke to him for five hours we didn't speak very long about 2001 space obviously for two reasons really mm-hmm. uh, one to keep him from having to repeat and repeat and repeat these stories and secondly because most kubrick fans have heard all the 2001 stories from kia so we did cover a lot of ground um with projects he'd done other than 2001 and i think particularly the first episode was covering movies up to 2001 including david and lisa and um uh, the bunny lake film um so yeah that was great uh, and i think we've got um so we put two episodes out the first one was before 2001 the second episode that went out was 2001 and we've got another two episodes to come in the future excellent okay so i'm gonna I have a question about here if i might mm-hmm. 
He was in the thin blue line, wasn't he? The the, the a documentary? No, a war movie. That was a war movie. The Malik. No, no, that's the red line. The original, the first ones, early 60s, before 2001. Oh, yes, yes, he oh, was. The thin, yes, re- oh, the thin red line. The damn color. Red line. Yes, 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 thank you. Oh, yeah. That was a good movie, as I remember it. Violent. Is that Sam Fuller, the director? No, it's... Uh, oh, uh, go ahead, Mark. Yeah. You know, Sam Fuller did the big red one. Yes. Okay, right, yeah. yeah. Good it's film. It's a great film. Oh, great. wonderful. Great, great film. That was like 1981, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, 1980. 1980. Uh, Andrew Martin or Andrew Martin. Keir DeLay, Jack Warden, James Philbrook, Kieran Moore. Three stars. What, yeah. what year was that? 64. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It was from uh, uh what's it? I can't remember the author. Uh he did he wrote uh I think it was I think it was James Jones. That's it, James Jones. Yeah, he wrote uh From Here to Eternity. So yeah. yes. I still found I still found Malik's version better, but I, there was something. There were a lot of good things in uh, Martin's yeah. version. Well, Malik's version was war was tragedy. It was a terribly downbeat, sad movie. Whereas, yeah, you know, I, I don't think anybody would have allowed uh, the studio probably wouldn't have allowed a downbeat anti-war movie in '64 at the. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, you take it into context, Mark. Yeah, you're right. All right. Well, on 412, Kubrick by Kubrick, released on French television. Well, I mean, in a work of fiction, you have to have conflict. If there isn't a problem in a story, it can almost by definition not be a story. A good story that you can make in a film is a miracle. And, you know, it's very hard to work miracles. And if Stanley trusts you, if he trusts you, you're all right. If he doesn't, beware. We did 105 takes on this thing, and take two was perfect. I have never done more than, say, 15 takes before in my life. Directing a movie, if you try to do it properly, is not always fun. Anyone see it? Have thoughts about it? Uh, it was, um, I thought it was a really good, uh, I mean, it was one of the best documentaries I think I've seen on Kubrick, but I think that was because it was by Kubrick, right? Um, so yeah. it was taking his words and voice. I thought it was, I thought it was a very well done, very well shot uh, documentary. I can't think of anything like new or surprising in it for people who know things about Kubrick, but uh, it, it was, it was a good solid documentary on him. And I, I think it's one of my favorite ones just to like introduce someone to Kubrick yeah, just because it does rely so much on Kubrick speaking himself. Is it, yeah. is it on YouTube or any other? Not platform? yet. Not yet. No, it's probably, I don't think it's really been widely distributed yet. It, it was a French, um, a French uh, documentary, wasn't it? Made, made in France by, uh, yeah. by A-R-T-E, Art. Yeah, Art. Yeah, there's a sort of Franco, Franco-German production. Yeah, Right. Um, and I actually uh, timed, I went through it and timed how much Kubrick was talking on there. So it was an hour-long documentary. I think, he ta- I think we heard Kubrick's voice for 22 minutes. That's what kind of nerd I am. <laughs> I'm not seeing a problem, stuff, Stephen. So, you know. Yeah. So, James, that was, that was basically, that was basically uh, all the audio of Kubrick's voice was taken from various uh, Michel Simon uh, interviews over the years, uh, which he recorded. Most of the interviews that Mich- Michel Simon um, rec- uh, recorded went straight to print. Uh, so it was the first time we'd really heard the original um, audio recordings of Kubrick's voice, I, I think. Oh, we have Maria. Hi, hey. Maria. Hello. Sorry, I uh, couldn't make it the earlier. How are you? Hello. Good. Welcome. Hello. Thank you. Hello. How are you? Very good. Uh, How are you? I'm... Fine. I'm freezing. Nothing to compare with you guys, but it's... Pretty cold for Mexico City today. Ah, Mexico City. No, uh, yeah, Maria, jump right in if 
Uh, we're going through the year and we've got up to May. Jump in if you have any Kubrick recollections. I know you can't stay long. Uh, I, uh, I don't have any recollections of this year other than being <laughs> like that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's been like a, a haze <laughs> all year. Well, Marie, you posted all that stuff on the on the monolith, right? Oh, oh yeah. yeah, we'll get to, oh, you know what? <laughs> Why don't we do the monolith since Marie is here? <laughs> Even though it's in November. <laughs> Any thoughts about I was the monolith? The, I was not the only one. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh, guys. <laughs> that was the story you just could not stop. No. Yeah, oh, yeah. We, anybody could stop. <laughs> we have to stop hundreds of posts. Uh, exact replicas of the of your post. Exactly. We'll, really? We we'll let you through, Maria. What? We we'll let your post through, but we had to. We stopped hundreds. Everyone was I trying know. to post about it. Um, <laughs> I think James Sherman and uh, Mark were more in control of the uh, monolith posts than I was. I, go, ahead, go ahead. I loved. I love the monolith. I'm obsessed with it. <laughs> and I think the reason why is because the default position that the entire world took exactly. was Stanley Kubrick's vision. <laughs> and I thought, and again, it goes back. Some of you heard me say this a thousand times. I'll say it again. Stanley Kubrick inhabits every square inch of human civilization. Okay. <laughs> I love the monolith. Okay. I'm even though it didn't even look like the monolith, right? Everybody <laughs> defaulted to Stanley Kubrick. Okay. So exactly. Exactly. There was no way that you, you could post it anywhere or, or on Twitter or whatever. And everybody had uh, the same reaction. Oh, that's the Kubrick monolith. Yeah. Yeah. That well, 2020 the, may go down as the year of the monolith. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I stopped reading. There were so many articles. I stopped reading them all. So the first one in Utah was had been there for a while when it was discovered, apparently, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so, what did these people do? They dug a hole at like, three feet and then and, and stuck the slab in, and then how it was, was it going? was a, an art project to promote a, a group. I forgot that there was something people. It was like a group of artists doing this, and then they uh, sell the the thing. I don't know for it was like a serious amount of money. And then people was, just started copying. There was one in Romania, one in California, another one. But, but apparently, it was the same people. This, this, like, I'm waiting for Banksy to, to do his version of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, excellent, and Yeah, good idea. <laughs> there has been one, about 120 monoliths discovered around the world in oh, November wow. and December, according to Wikipedia, which I looked on really? last week. There's 120, 100 and odd. I, I, I couldn't really count them. I just scrolled and scrolled and scrolled. <laughs> all over the world, all discovered in November and December. We've only really been exposed to four or five on the news. But if you look at Wikipedia, they were all over the world. Well, have a look at this. On the right is an image from the sci-fi movie 2001, A Space Odyssey. On the left, well, that is a giant shiny monolith that's been discovered in the Utah desert. Government biologists tracking wild sheep populations from the air spotted it, but no one can really figure out where it came from. Well, yeah. what, a, what a tribute to 2001 and Kubrick. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Too bad they didn't get any money. <laughs> it, it's a pity they vanished uh, at Costco, or I would have brought one home. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Yeah, a great kid, I, Christmas gift. Yeah. Great like, stocking I, stuffer. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it, that Katharina. I loved it that Katharina embraced it. She absolutely. She was like when it first the first story first broke. She actually posted on her Twitter feed. You know, it's like, hey, Dad, are you listening? Or something. It was something along that. <laughs> He embraced, embraced the matter. <laughs> <laughs> He's a great ambassador for the Kubrick legacy. Absolutely. She's a wonderful really. lady. Oh, you know what also, what also a Kubrick moment there was with the X-Dragon thing on space. There was... Oh, uh, yeah. uh, there, was there was a video of the, the thing uh, coupling with the other thing and somebody put the... the the 2001 theme on it and and That's Katrina great. was yeah. like was delighted with it it was because it was also it, it was like perfect exactly the same not the same but you know it was that thing that you saw and you, 
immediately thought, no, you know, this is 2001 done in real life. Well, it's much better that the that the focus of 2020 was the monolith rather than a clockwork orange. <laughs> <laughs> I would have liked it. You know? <laughs> and, and I'm not completely throwing out that it won't be when we do it. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I, I'm with you. This monolith, you're the monolith. That's, that's <laughs> Wait for it. <laughs> I'm waiting for someone to to send back a, a photo from the moon where the, where someone has put it up there as a joke. <laughs> <laughs> that would be amazing. <laughs> All right, James Sherman. I want to turn it back over to you. Uh, we're up to five twenty three on our little list. Okay, and that was the great 40th anniversary of the release of The Shining. I was there that day. I was there for opening the oh, opening day. It was a matinee. I skipped school. I skipped that was my senior year in high school. I skipped school. And I will admit in public, okay, when I first saw it, I didn't like it. Okay. Now, of course, 40 years later, I believe it to be one of the great masterpieces of cinema okay and i do believe it is the greatest horror film ever made but it was interesting and i had a lot of reaction and i think we had a discussion about that ian if you remember one of the times we were talking about the shining a lot of people sort of kind of had that same experience that the shining was so confounding and it was so in uh, complex and and just on so many different levels you know messaging on so many different levels i think i was 18 i didn't get it okay it took me several years it took me 12 years to finally see what the genius it was and then what's really special about it for me was that it became even more special over the years since 1992 that, that and now it's it's moved and i was joking with ian i said uh ian and the the, the, your, the group okay scott's uh, uh, group has turned you know it's now in my top 10 favorite films of all time so it's like you know yeah i mean it moved way up the list okay you know it's like it's like you know like when sight and sound does the uh, best films you know the top 10 films it's like it's moved up there so i remember that well i mean it was like it was such a great moment so i always celebrate it as a celebration of my ignorance as 18 so well, i have to credit this group because just listening to some of the insights and the details in, in The Shining, and then having seen the exhibit when it was in San Francisco, there were just elements in there that were absolutely brilliant. Yeah. And that is such a fine level of detail that it, it required the kind of dissection and documentation of this group. And I, I think people are going to be looking at that as well as 2001 and others for years. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think there's no end. You're right, Ann. I think there's no end to what is is up there on that screen for that film for that Absolutely. two hours 20 minutes it's just there's oceans that are still remaining to be discovered you know uh, and my initial reaction was exactly the same as yours james when i saw it i thought what's this about this is this is rubbish and uh, yeah. you know it, it's, it's changed over time i mean it's just amazing the way the film has a life of its own and you know when you look into it you get more out of it yeah and for me i think it was like it really made me appreciate dr sleep <laughs> oh, I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> Please. Good it's a for you. <laughs> Please. You know, no, I, 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 you know, no, Dr. Sleep was horrible. It was a horrible film. And, and what, and what killed me was, was that they were boxed into a corner because Stanley Kubrick is the vision of The Shining. End of the discussion. You know, he is the universe's vision of The Shining. You know, and it's like, and I, I understand, and I never try to get into the arguments about Stephen King and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, it's like, but the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, 40 years later, I have, Maria, you got something to say here. So go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, no, no, go, no. Finish and I'll go say, later. Yeah, I was just going to say, it was like, if they had made Dr. Sleep directly from Stephen King's book, it would have been a fun movie. Okay, and the stuff that's in the movie uh, from the, the Stephen King's novel is actually the best part about it. When they delved into trying to recreate the the, the, the Shining, Stu Kubrick's version of The Shining, it was deplorable. It was off the rails bad, you know. And it was like, I mean, the the the, the, sh the overlook they made the overlook one of the greatest sets in cinema. Okay, looked like a haunted house from from a high school. A, you know, a Halloween haunted house, right? You know, so, uh, yeah, I, I just had to throw Dr. Sleep out there because it was like, you know, it just was such an abomination. 
you know, just, uh, and I'm not, you know, one of those guys that, you know, oh God, I'm, I, I'm a Stanley Kubrick fan. I, okay. You know, have some respect. So yeah, I just, well, yeah, I had a, I had a different reaction when I, when I saw the shining the first time. Yeah. And cause it made the, the hair on the back of my neck stand yeah. up and there were only rare other, I'll say horror mystery type films that did something like that. Um, the Haunting of Hill House or something, I, I, not Hill House. Uh, I can't remember that, uh, where the it was haunting. a black and white film where- Robert Wise. Robert yeah, Wise, The Haunting. Robert, the Haunting, The Haunting. Yeah. The Haunting, The Haunting. That that based was, on The Haunting of Hill House. Yeah. One of my favorite horror films because you see nothing, but you, the terror is there. And and I, I felt that in The Shining. Um, so it, it was, just you know, series of horrific things, and, and uh, among this architecture, with a very muted soundtrack that just built and built. And I, I loved the film as much as it terrified me. And and I, and I thought, you know, Jack Nicholson's performance was over the top. <laughs> but there were just those details, even back then. Little details, whether it was the, the photograph or or certain visualizations before I could really get into the cinematography of it, it just stand in my mind from that original viewing. It Absolutely. sounds like it sounds like you got it instantly. Whereas I, I'm in the camp where it took many years to really appreciate the shining. Yes. Yeah, I think Stephen is because we just didn't we have never seen anything like it. Yeah, we, we had never, and we were sort of like it was like going to the to the to the uh, hotel room at the end of the universe in two thousand one. This is just nothing. Well, we needed something like that just to be connected to such a complex film as this. And the thing is, it took maturity and time. Yes, you know? and was, they're obviously very, harder than the rest of it. So I was you know. very immature in nineteen eighty. I really was. I was. I was ten years old. So. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you were I, probably more mature than me at 18 so yeah <laughs> I, I got it on video I first saw it on video when I was maybe 15, 16 in 85, 86 and I still just had it on the shelf and kept trying it again every few years and it weren't until probably the age of DVD where I started thinking yes, this is a good film I knew it was yeah, kind of thing yeah, yeah but I, I think Anne is smarter than the rest of us. You have a question, sir? Well, I, I had been oh, when, when I was in college. I actually ran the films, which I don't know if Mark remembered. But if you remember the films in Irvine, that that's what I did. I, I ran oh. that whole film selection. So I, I ran a lot of films um, yeah. of, of different types over the years. So I did have some appreciation of it, and I still reme remember meeting. I'm trying to remember it was my junior senior year somewhere somewhere in there uh, was someone who had was, I liked very much because I thought American Graffiti was a fabulous film and he was going to be coming out with this kind of cowboys in space type thing I wasn't quite <laughs> sure how it was going to come out and I still have the original poster sitting here what Ooh. Star Wars <laughs> yes it was <laughs> wow. But American Graffiti, so, uh, yeah, I did have some appreciation, particularly because if you're developing a film viewing for, for a large audience and you're looking at the films and you're seeing their reaction, because a lot of, and you've seen it before, but you're seeing reaction. So maybe that's why when I saw The Shining, it just hit me in certain ways. And also by that point, I started school as an architecture major. So seeing that architectural element to it, Maybe that's why I saw it a little bit differently. Yeah. Um, uh, 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 Mark Lenz, yeah, gentlemen, the, the iPad person, I didn't get your name. Yeah, this is Jerry First. How are oh, you? Jerry, hi, Jerry. I'm sorry. I just, I didn't get your name. I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, go ahead. Ben. You had a comment? Uh, yeah, for me, living in South Florida uh, and watching The Shining uh, when it did first come out, we here have a very unique experience because uh when the caretaker was in, in South Florida taking his vacation, they interrupted the, they interrupted the scene with Channel 10 News. Yeah. So you're sitting there watching the movie when all of a sudden <laughs> you get this break where it's like, wait a second, are, 
are we in the movie theater? Or are we, are, where's, where's Channel 10 News coming from? So, that was a great cut. That was a great screen. Uh, you know, and I, I hear all the accolades going on. And, you know, my reaction seeing The Shining several times is the fact that you've got, at the very end, a... I mean, it, it comes out to me that it's the ultimate ghost story, uh, the haunt, ultimate haunted house. And so at the end of the movie, you know, Jack Nicholson's in the in the picture from the 1920s. So, uh, you know, that's what kind of, in other words, what kind of a time portal uh, or, or, or something else is happening here. It's kind of like part of my observations. Oh. All right. Well, we'll be here until 5 p.m. if we don't get moving. <laughs> uh, next, James. Uh, let's see. What was the next after the 23rd? Uh, oh, Ian. Ian. Just give a plug for Ian. Releases the games. The uh, the games room book. It's uh, still not. It's uh, 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 Ian. If you want to just mention just brief. Uh, yeah, that was back in June, I think. I put it up on Kindle, and uh, uh, shortly after that, I had uh, uh, some hard copies made. I mean, it's not, yeah, al although it's sort of available and there's an ISBN and everything, it doesn't have a uh, sort of world renowned publisher behind it. But, uh, uh, but you know, it's, it, those who've been reading it have been giving some favorable feedback, so I'm very pleased with that. And uh, yeah, it's all about The Shining and how my, my interpretation of it being a puzzle. Uh, and uh, I've done uh, several years of research into it, so there's a lot of background to it. I know Stephen's uh, uh, read it, uh, or uh, to be more precise, read, read a, an early draft of it, which was about two years old. Uh, yeah. And uh, so, uh, so th th there's the new version out now, and uh, uh, I think Mark's downloaded. And James, your your, your version's on the way. Really? Oh, fantastic! Thank you. <laughs> All right. How much do I owe you? Uh, we'll talk oh, about no. it. We'll, we'll, we'll worry about that afterwards. We'll about that <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm looking so forward to do that. You've changed my life, Ian. <laughs> now, if you can get me to quit smoking, it would be perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so, cool. Yeah. I'll, and I'll definitely, maybe I'll give a review. Uh, uh, you know, when I get a chance to read it, we'll have one of these and I can give a review. And uh, maybe other people, St Stephen, if you wanted to as well, you know, and just encourage everybody to get this book. You know, it just sounds exciting to me. So yeah, well, I, I need to read the I need to read read the latest version of it, and then we we'll probably do a, uh, an official podcast where we uh, interview you. Yeah, that'd be, great. that'd be great, Ian. That'd be fantastic. That'd be yeah, great. Yeah. Uh, I'll get in touch with you, Stephen. We'll, I'll get get a copy to you as well. So lovely. Okay. Can you sign? Can you oh, no. sign it this yeah. time, please? What was it? Sign, it. sign it this time. <laughs> oh yeah, Ian. Did you sign your copy to me? <laughs> you really, yeah. Uh, Send it back. I'm just going <laughs> to. Oh, no. Well, don't worry about that, James. <laughs> Stephen, if I sign it, it'll devalue it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys, moving on. Uh, let's see, James. James, you, uh, James Nick, uh, you did the uh, the Kubre interview. Yeah, did can you, you tell us about that, James? Yeah. Um, that was has that been? You mean the podcast? Has that been put up already? No, it's not up, but it did happen this year. Oh, that's what. So we're talking about the pot up to this point, when we were talking about podcasts, we were talking about release dates because many all the ones that we had mentioned before had actually been performed in 2019 or earlier. So they're talking about. I actually talked to. Um, geez, I'm so. I didn't. I didn't really know you guys were going to be bringing this up. I, I forgot his name. Oh, already. it's okay. Well, we talked to, yeah, I forget his name too, but he does the little Kubri figure. Yeah. So, like a, uh, Whatever his name is. So some guy, <laughs> was he, he's in Spain and uh, he's on SCAS, but he doesn't, uh, you know, he doesn't, he's kind of in the background. He, I, I see him giving likes here and there once in a while, but he doesn't talk too much. And he makes this little, um, if I had done this, I would have had a, a photo ready, but he does these little, like, two inch tall, rubber figures of, of Kubrick and it's he, oh, yeah. and he chose them and he sells them and they're the, the detail in them is amazing and he does other ones on his website he has Steve Buscemi and he has um a, a, a lot of other interesting characters and the detail is amazing you have to really look closely 
zoom in on the picture or or hold the little figure up to you, up to your face really closely. And it, it's a, it's a remarkable job that he does. So he took a picture of Kubrick, I think, from the set of Barry Lyndon or something with his big green parka, and he has it one hand in his he has uh, like it, his hand in his pocket. He's got a book. I mean, it, it's just amazing. Yeah, so I actually cool. painted it. They come in. They're so small that he can't really. They're they're one color. It's either one is orange, one is you can get an orange or green. So we just talked to him about his process, how he makes them, why he you know why he chose to do them, and how he makes them. And it was a really yeah. interesting call. And Wes Calamer, who you may know from SCAS, was in on the call because he years of, he was the first person to buy them to buy one and he has gone all over America to various sites that have some connection to Kubrick films, such as the real hotel, the, the, what is it? The Stanley hotel? No, there's three. There's the Stanley hotel. Yeah. The one, the, the one where they, that, where, Coop, where King wrote the book. Then there's another one where they use the exterior shots where Jan went on second unit and took the exterior shots for that of the overlook. <laughs> what is that one called? I forget. Oh, the, the uh, um, um, yeah, Mount Hood. What's that? Lodge. That's it. Yeah, that's it. My that's mom it. has been there. And then there's one uh, with an Indian name, where, um, I think it's in California, where they got the inspiration for the lobby. The Awani. Yeah, the Awani. So he went to places like that, and he would take, the, he would take these amazing photographs, and he... Uh, with the Kubri and he did this, he would like get down on his belly and get this shot that made the Kubri look like it was six feet tall. Somehow he made these incredible photographs where he would get this low angle and, and the Kubri would be in the forefront and whatever the, the location where he was going was in the background and it made the little twin. Well, I think he had like a four inch version and it made it look so much better. And he did it every every six months or so. West would pop another one of those pictures on Scat. And yeah. uh, so I said, look. And so we got West in on the call. And um, it was. Yeah. We need him. We need him to do that to one of the monoliths. Uh, <laughs> Alice, uh, Alessandro uh, Randy. Right, yeah, that's it, yeah. yeah, that's it. That's it. Um, okay, on, on June 27th, we had the first Kubrick hour uh, uh, for that year, I guess, right? Correct, Mark? And uh, that's when we uh, interviewed, uh, we spoke with Elizabeth Joffe, who was, uh, did I, Yaffe? Did I, Yaffe? Did I pronounce her name correctly? I, Coffee uh, with Yaffe. Yeah, Coffee with Yaffe. And uh, she was the producer of um, um, uh, Film Worker. She was one of the producers of Film Worker. And that was a great, that was kind of my first sort of, you know, Kubrick meeting online and it was fascinating. It was absolutely fascinating. So that wasn't the first one of the year. That was the first one ever. So Mark, we, we've oh. talked on Zoom and Skype before. Yeah. Mark decided to give it a name. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? Let me run through them now. Uh, starting from the beginning. Yeah. I mean, there's one good thing that came out of the pandemic for me and that's these Zoom calls. Yeah. Like we used to go to different places and see Kubrick films. Uh, but when a pandemic happened, we couldn't do that anymore. So we just started Zooming. And uh, we tried different things as we've gone along. I met Elizabeth at one of the uh, film festival screenings. of, And uh, she gave just a great interview. And uh, since then, we tried yeah different things. One is take a movie and study it. Uh, then we highlighted The Shining at 40. We had Jeremy on again. Uh, oh, and then Jorge gave a wonderful presentation on Leonard Wheat's book that's now out of print. And uh, authors giving presentations works very well. We've had a couple of them. Oh, and another good one we did was everyone showed something personal to them that had a special Kubrick meeting. And that brought us some really good stories. Same with the personal favorite moments. Uh, oh, and then we got into The Shining and are discussing it at a very deep level 
and we've been doing that for yeah. talk about looking like for the a good lab. month. Yeah. yeah, really talk about looking in the middle of the labyrinth with that one, right? <laughs> and I uh, will be continuing with it. It's very interesting because when you're talking to people in person, you can ask them very pointed questions and understand better and more quickly what they're trying to get across. Uh, our favorite books about Kubrick. And uh, then we had Ian give a presentation on one aspect of his thinking. And uh, then we did Full Metal Jacket. No, I'm sorry. Then we did Young because we're none of yeah, us really knew Jung. what Young yeah. was about. We tried <laughs> to understand that. And then, yeah, we had Rob Vatcher come on and kind of open our eyes about ways you could see Full Metal Jacket that I had never considered, such as uh, them being the mistake squad. In the second half of the movie, they make the squad makes every possible mistake right. that you could make, according to Rob, who has been in the military. So we're learning a lot. We want to try different things in the next year. Uh, anybody has suggestions? We're very open to them, and we're going to try to do them every Saturday. And I really look forward to them every week. Are, are they actually available um, to to view? The ret- I'd love to go back and look at last week's, actually, from, from what you said. There's a bit of a backlog. Right. <laughs> <laughs> they, they will be available. Uh, but you're recording this, audio. Yes. We're all recording them. All right. right. Yep. And they will go on our YouTube SCAS channel. Mm-hmm. And uh, this one will be available quickly mm-hmm. as a podcast. So I think with that, we did get right. we did get one episode. Um, we got the the first one with um, coffee with the offer. We, we we've got that one out on the channel, haven't we? Yes, yes. He's the only one who's up there. Uh, James, let's skip to eight eighteen. Eight eighteen, yes, was the um, the uh, Stanley Kubrick, the American filmmaker, a biography by uh, David. Let me see if I can do this. McKeeks. Did I? Mickix. 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 Okay. All right. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. And uh, Stevens there's got the book. It's fading in and out mysteriously f- uh, with his background. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a proper biography? That word sometimes gets it's, uh, misused. Is that a, 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 a bi- Does it talk about his childhood? Is it, is it a discussion? It's of part of the Jewish Live series. Right. And Stephen, you've read it. Muted who's read it well i have got the book in my hand and i've had it for several months now but i haven't read it i think it's got some good reviews some mixed reviews so far they call it a biography we don't know only there's only been two full life biographies baxter and labruto i'm curious if this one is just talking about his film career or about the man let us know when you find out Steve. But anyway, that came out this year, and that was that that that's on my list. That's on my Amazon list, so I gotta I've got to get that one. So uh, maybe I'll do a review of that when I finally get to read it. So let's we could probably have David on as well. Oh, uh, that'd be great. Yeah, that'd be if, good. Maybe that would be a good one. Yeah. yeah. Now I want to go yeah, through a couple a couple more Kubrick universes that came out around this time, <laughs> and starting with Adrian Bush, uh, Stephen. He had yeah. a lot of good stories. Uh, so, yes, that, w- that was a great one. That was a lot of fun um, during the actual conversation back in 2018. And it was also a lot of fun to um, to, to put together in the edit as well. Yeah. Uh, Adrian was a good laugh. And he was kind of one of the one of the people. We spoke to a few people who've worked on the movies, but I suppose uh, that's worked on the Kubrick movies. But I th- Adrian had kind of a different take on it, really, because he was kind of... Um, you know, it wasn't a star name. It was, it was kind of a um, an extra playing one of the, the uh, many Marines. So he could afford to tell some quite tasty tales because he wasn't worried about being kicked out of the kicked out of the movie business. Uh, so yeah, that that was great. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, the next one, Mike Scott, yes, <sighs> who made his own two thousand and one spacesuit. That was a very interesting how-to from a model maker's point of view. I think that was another uh, character that uh, you and Jason met back at in at the uh, two thousand and one 
uh, exhibit at the beginning of the year. That's where um, Jason uh, hooked up with Mike to get him on the show. And that, and that was a really interesting um, episode as well. Yeah, brilliant. He's a good guy, Mike. So, let's see. Um, moving, let's see. Oh, just a, a brief, you know, on, on in September 2nd, we had Wendy Carlos and her biography was released. Again, it's another uh, on my list at uh, Amazon. So hopefully I'll get to read that soon. Uh, big fan of Wendy. I think she's a great artist and her contribution to, to cinema is, is, is very profound. So yes. let's see. Uh, oh, and I haven't bought it yet, but the Full Metal Jacket was released on 4K. Uh, does anybody have it? Does anybody have the copy yet? No. no. 4K. Yeah, the 4K. Of Can 4K. I ask a question about 4K? Sure. Yeah. Okay. What? Why is 4K so great? What is uh? What? What? And it is how advanced is it over the? Previous iteration. <laughs> well, well, it's more expensive, so obviously it's got to be better. <laughs> ah! Yeah, that's well, it. I, then I don't need it. <laughs> but, uh, but, <laughs> no, um, somebody can explain that who knows more technical information than I do. A higher okay. resolution. Yeah, it is a higher resolution. Okay, so it's it's you're, it's the, the, the image uh, res is more uh, sharp. I, I'm no expert in this, but I believe that this sort of the current Blu-ray is 2K. And the 4K obviously doubles that, uh, so you get a you do oh, get a sharper okay. image, but you need to have all the gear to play it. Some, somebody bought me a 4K uh, copy of uh, Blade Runner, which I haven't been able to watch yet because I don't have the gear. But uh, it's supposed to be about as fine. I think the next stage up is 8K, whereupon you're actually getting beyond the level of the human eye anyway. So. <laughs> Uh, well, and there'll be a group of hipsters. There will be a group of hipsters in the upcoming years who will insist that the original uh, 2K or 1K <laughs> or whatever it is was really the best one, and um, yeah. and they'll buy old machines to play it on. So anyway, sorry guys. Yeah, and I also I, I think they're UHD um, stuff too, which is like a higher color gamut. So supposedly it can do better color accuracy. And I think that's more important than the resolution really but personally, but um, yes. that's, that's the only thing that is interesting is it, it right. has a, like a larger color gamut. Mark, right. you're going to say something, Mark McKinnon? Well, most 4Ks, if not all of them are rendered from the original prints. So you're getting the, uh, as close to the color timing and the, uh, the, 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 the tone of, of the cinematography that the director originally wanted. So since Stanley was so meticulous in how his movies were shot and the lighting and everything, if you take a 4K from an original print of, say, Barry Lyndon, you're looking at the film as as close to the original screening as you're going to get on a TV screen. Right. right. So if, if it's 2K, you're not, it's not degrading the movie that much, but the difference between a 2K and a 4K or a predecessor of 2k which is like what 1080p or something uh you're you know it's a major upgrade it's a fairly substantial upgrade in the color the resolution and i guess in all cases as well the sound so you're getting the whole nine yards in your living room rather than go to a theater yeah, I believe also did did not Mr. Fatali work on those on the 4K restorations and uh, I believe sure. he did yes. yes, he did. I think he said that in in the uh, Mark Lentz didn't he say that when we had him there at the uh, yes yeah yeah uh, okay. James James yes. you have a question James James M Nick comment um, the uh, release of Full Metal Jacket on 4K was also noteworthy because Matthew went on it crazy uh, promotion tour of sorts just popping up all over the place promoting the 4k and he's doing interview after interview after interview which is pretty interesting i mean i only listened to a couple of them because it gets repetitive but it's already 33 years from the, since the movie came out so yeah. it's an opportunity for more people to see the film <laughs> and there was one uh interview i i it just i found it so funny he was on the rich eisen show uh, he's um, a sportscaster here in America, and he, uh, he has a, a radio show, which is also on TV. And when the show opened, he was saying, and one of our guests today is Matthew Modine. I'm so excited. 
Although I'm just such a big Kubrick fan, so I put that on. I actually took that out of the show and put it on on my YouTube channel because his producer just started saying, uh, uh, "I don't, I don't watch those movies." And they had this whole extracting debate about the nature of cinema, and he was just saying how great Kubrick is, and he's just a master in the history of cinema. And he's like, oh, I don't watch it. And the other guy was saying, I don't watch those old movies. Who cares about these old movies? <laughs> he was schooling him. And the, the guy was actually 40. I had to look it up to say, how, I thought he was like 22 or something. <laughs> <laughs> there's, you know, there's people who are 40 who think mo- movies from 80 are old movies and won't watch them, which is a shame. And so sometimes these new 4K and then they'll be 8K and then they'll be 16K. At least it's an opportunity for people. It gives people an excuse to watch something. Yeah. Um, one of the things I wanted to mention, Mark, was the uh, one of the uh, uh, um, uh, the the Kubrick Universe uh, from uh, the 30th of September. It was with uh, Gay Hamilton. Oh and yeah. But he wanted to just mention a couple lines about you know how that went. I thought it was such a treat to be on the line during this call. She's such a nice person compared to her character. <laughs> I have taken the ribbon from around my neck and hidden it somewhere on my purse. If you find it, you can have it. You are free to look for it any way you will, and I will think very little of you if you do not find it. Well, it sounds like you've told us uh, about your part in that scene where uh, you hid the ribbon down your top, and... uh, (laughs) Lift one, lift the right one. Yeah, yeah. Really was funny. I wasn't laughing, (laughs) guys. Right. You were being very professional. Uh Ha ha. Ha ha. I cannot find it. You haven't looked properly. Your your character does instigate quite a lovely kiss with Redmond at the close of that scene. And and it's 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 a very poignant moment. It's a very beautiful one. We're just wondering what it was like uh, to perform that, and if you were forced, as it were, to do many takes. No, no, it, I I I don't think I minded. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot find it. Well, that's the hint. Well, we're not, we're not talking. Some some of the some of the scenes in the very old days, you, you wouldn't believe. I'm talking about televisions and other things I did, mm-hmm. where you wouldn't believe what the actors did to you if they were kissing. You know, mm-hmm. it doesn't happen anymore. Right, right. I feel the rhythm. Why are you trembling? I think Ryan was um, pretty good on that because he was so under the vigilance of Kubrick that I think he had to behave. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course. I think I didn't. I did. I think he was delightful, actually. And he was going to be coming over. I think it was a couple of years ago. And I would have loved to see him again because mm. we definitely got on very well, you know. Mm. I thought she was very engaging. I thought she was lovely. I would have loved to have been in the room with her, you know, or at least, in, in, you know what I mean? It's like, she just seems like, I've seen her interviewed in other places as well. And she just comes across as a very unpretentious, really kindly. And I liked her stories. She had some really good stories. Yeah, she did. Yeah. Yeah, she did. She was, a, yeah, a lovely lady. Very much the lady of the of the highest sort. Didn't she keep a little yeah. box? She kept notes from that contemporary yeah. Yes, she, she she wrote a diary. Yes, um, which is which was what she used to uh, help her with the recollections. Yeah, because it, uh, it was forty five years ago. She's in her seventies now. Um, but I actually I ended up arranging that interview with her because I, I I met her in uh, London last year. Last year, 
yeah, 2019. I met her in London, bumped into her at um, a, f- a film festival and uh, we swapped contacts. And uh, yeah, that was uh, amazing that uh, how that came about, really, how that interview came about. So let's see, moving on real quick so we can get through this. Um, let's see. Oh, uh, on the 7th of October, we have the 60th anniversary of the release of uh, Spartacus. So that was a milestone in Mr. Kubrick's career, obviously. A lot of uh, anniversaries this year. The Shining, uh, you know, Spartacus. Uh, um, uh, going towards the end, there's the 45th anniversary of the release of uh, uh, Barry Lyndon this year as well. So um, let me see. There was also on the 7th of October, it was announced that uh, Ridley Scott plans to film Napoleon with uh, Joaquin Phoenix. HBO has been trying to do this Kubrick script with director Carrie. Help me with this, Mark Lentz. Uh, I am such a... Anyway. I have never seen it. Yeah, okay. So, so, uh, <laughs> really, yeah. HBO has been trying to do the Kubrick script with uh, th- this director with a Japanese name I can't pronounce. Uh, so, uh, But apparently now Ridley Scott, I guess, has jumped in front and he's going to be involved with that. We'll see if it happens. It's, uh, uh, But that's the latest news. Um, let's see, on the 15th of October, uh, Room 237 pop-up experience opens in Chicago. And so anybody have information on that? I've heard about it, but I don't have any details. No? Yeah, okay. That happened this year. Okay. Uh, and then, as we already discussed, a mysterious monolith is found in the desert of Utah. Its origins are completely unknown. Uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, and uh, we, we've talked about that. Uh, let's see. Oh, a classic and a thing. And Nick, uh, James Nick, uh, fantastic on you. Uh, the National Registry from the Library of Congress announced its, it, it, its an annual editions and a clockwork orange has been added. And so now I think we start to fight to get Barry Lyndon added to that. And that should happen. That should happen. But I know, James, you had a lot to do and a lot of work that you've done on that to try to get that, you know, and and, and promoting uh, uh, that, you know, we go to the websites and make those votes and things like that. So good job. I personally think you are personally and completely responsible for that. So. <laughs> yes. Hear, hear. Yeah. That's right. um, uh, on the 18th, just today, yesterday, uh, Stanley Cooper Produces by James Fenwick is released. And I, I, I'm sure we've all seen it now since it came out last night. But, uh, <laughs> we, we see, there it is. There it is. Uh, Stephen's got the book there. Okay. And um, he, he I, would be a, he would be great to have uh, on a, a podcast. Uh, Mr. Fenwick, Fenwick. Yeah, James Fenwick. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he, he's very good. I'm only a. Um... In your- I'm only a quarter way into it. I started oh. reading it this morning, and it is a good book. It is a good book. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't recommend things very often, but I'm already recommending this. Guys, guys, I can't afford to be a Stanley Kubrick fan, so, uh, but I'll work on this. I'll work on this. No, no wine tonight. No wine tonight. I'll get that book. It has a different angle than no other book ever had before. It's just about him being a producer. Yeah, it's a great, great angle. I mean, not everyone will probably like that angle, but for me, it's a, it's a good angle um, that I haven't, yep. say I haven't heard before. I mean, you, you've heard the general gist of his producing. Oh, it this it really concentrates on him as a producer and not a director. Yes. Yeah. That fascinates me. That seems like a fascinating <laughs> But like you said, Steve, it had never been explored before. It's a new territory. Yes. You know, yeah. And, and James is, uh, I, I know James, and he's a, he's a really uh, he's a really good guy who I'm sure would be really good in a podcast, as I say. So yeah. might want to bear him in mind. Uh, Stephen was on the ball with these recent Kubrick auctions of memorabilia. Oh yes, can you give us the rundown on them, Stephen? Yes, so I kind of uh, follow uh, movie auctions. Um, in September this year. The prop store in LA uh, auctioned off two or three uh, Kubrick lots. Uh, and then in November, Profiles in History, which is, uh, I think it's California based auction house, um, they sold some items from Spartacus, uh, Lawrence Olivier's tunic, Charles Lawton's tunic, and supposedly uh, Kirk Douglas's actual hero dagger. Which I'm dubious about that one because I've seen <laughs> I've seen it a few times in various places as the as the official Kirk Douglas one, uh, so that was in November, and then 
in December, Julian's Auctions, again in, in the States, had a very interesting um, lot, which was a briefcase, uh, like a 1960s style briefcase. And within that briefcase were three Kubrick items. So the briefcase supposedly originally belonged to Kubrick. It, it had a return address in there saying, if you find this uh, briefcase, please return to, um, I think it was Elstree, uh, one of the studios in London, um, which pointed towards Kubrick with the address. Um, and it also in there was um, a couple of audio cassettes, like the old reel-to-reel uh, recording cassettes. One was, I think, a 1971 interview regarding uh Clockwork Orange, and there was another audio tape in there, I think, to do with 2001. I didn't take much notice of those items because there was an, uh, an item in there that I was particularly interested about, which was um, a 35mm film reel, which was supposedly outtakes from Eyes Wide Shut. So, so the, the lot was basically a briefcase with three reels in there, a film reel and two audio reels. And that didn't sell. It had a I think it had a four thousand dollar starting price. The highest bid on the night was three thousand five hundred, so it went unsold. So, if anyone listens to this, if they if if they are the owner of this particular lot, please get in touch. <laughs> Don't worry about that. I'm dying, I'm, dying to see, I'm dying to see what's on that film reel from Eyes Wide Shut because it's yeah. a, an, un, an unused uh, sixteen minute reel of film. <laughs> wow. I thought all of that was destroyed. Yes, exactly. Uh, I, <laughs> wow. All the uh, outtakes <laughs> and all that. Yeah, well, and I've, seen, I've, seen the, I've seen the first frame on that reel. And it's basically uh, a clapperboard saying, as well, shoot with a, a date. And you can see the uh, the interior of the costume shop behind. So there's at least one frame on there that's authentic. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Be careful though, Stephen. Be careful though, Stephen. It wasn't all burned. Yeah, <laughs> Stephen, you could be buying you could be buying uh, 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 Al Capone's vault. So I <laughs> just yeah, you know, but it would be fascinating. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we'll get Geraldo to do it. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. Is there so many things that. Uh, you find Kubrick everywhere on, on Telegram, the messaging system. They have, I mean, they, they constantly take releasing stickers for the chat. And it's wonderful. I mean, they have so many with Kubrick references that it's just, it's like maybe the most referenced movies of of everything I find there because they, they always of course they have the here's Johnny uh, sticker in every single version you can think of and they have so many this and Star Wars of course but yeah I think that's amazing thing, this huh? uh, Kubrick and Star Wars that's it isn't it exactly there are so many movies and they it's always uh, Star Wars which are very easily recognize but it's uh, it's curious how many uh, Kubrick movies are referenced and and you would think think that I don't know how many people have seen a, a clockwork orange and they can get the reference mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I, I mean I, I still think that Kubrick is still not widely known really. exactly but think, but Stephen his images are His images are. If you said to somebody yeah. the two, I mean, it's like I, I'll give you a real quick example. It's like it's like a friend of mine who has twins, twin daughters. Okay, when they were seven years old, they used to freak their parents out by holding their hands and saying, "Come play with us, mommy," or "Come play with us, dad." And they had never seen the film. Okay, I mean, they have never. It's just part of the culture now, and it's like. You're right, Stephen. I don't think they know that it's Kubrick. Everybody knows Star Wars is George Lucas, right? But I think with Kubrick, okay, it's like, yeah, maybe they don't make the connection, but they know his films. They know the references. And that's probably a reflection on the fact that Kubrick kept so private. The fact that he, he never became a, a person, you know, a, a, a no, he wasn't famous, famous himself. And, and, and it's actually quite amazing that his films are actually standing on their own merit rather than standing on a person behind them. And yeah. the images are icons yeah, because yeah. it's like you, you see it and you know it's Kubrick. I mean, we know it's Kubrick, but other people, like, they get it. Even if they don't know the name of the director, but they it's like 
they don't doubt it. It's like exactly. they know it. It's very cool, isn't it? Really, it's a very yeah. cool yeah. thing that Kubrick did there. Yeah, yeah the, the artist, the artist is hiding behind his work. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, not like, say, Hitchcock, who made it, you know, and, and that was to sell tickets. I mean, Hitchcock, you know, was to do it. To, and he made himself a personality in the media and stuff like that. And George Lucas, of course, everybody knows who George Lucas is because of the proliferation of Star Wars. But the thing is, is I think one of the greatest, I think what's really cool is, though, America gets, the world gets, the universe gets the greatest artist of the 20th century okay and they get all they may not even know his name okay but they even but you know it's like how many people go yeah kubrick don't even maybe have never seen a kubrick movie have said kubrick uh, uh filmed the, the 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 fake moon landing right as a joke mm-hmm. right even though they don't even they might not even know what the reference is right so i think that's really cool i think it's right mark uh mckinnon you raise your hand we ought to try to take a uh fairly rough poll of how many TV commercials from pizza (laughs) to cars to uh, jewelry. I've seen everything using uh, either a classical rendition or a cheesy, uh, you know, studio version of uh, the theme music from 2001. Oh, God, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Just the Blue Dan U. there's, there's There's must easily two dozen of them that I've seen over the years. Two thousand one. Over a hundred. Uh, there's a, an Excel spreadsheet in the SCAS group of all the. I wrote a chapter for a book on the history of Kubrick in TV commercials. That's right. You sent that yeah. to me. Oh, and how many have used the music from two thousand and one? At least twenty. Mm-hmm. At least that's that's one of the most common things. Yeah. yeah. You know, that's something that that we could do is we could look at two thousand one. <laughs> And see which technologies now exist. Mm. Oh, the iPad. Yes. Yeah. Think of think of all the various ones. Whether it's the, uh, you know, we're, we're using Zoom. Think of the telephone where he's viewing home. Yeah. Yes. But there, there, there are a number of different items. It's it's very similar to looking at the original version of Star Trek and saying, "Oh, look!" Because actually, as it turned out, on the original Star Trek the person who developed the cell phone was inspired by Star Trek. So I'm curious now right. whether there was anything in 2001 that inspired someone. Well, Steve there- Jobs Steve Jobs did say that the iPad came from 2001. I mean, he said that He said that to employees. He said that in, mm-hmm. I don't know if he's ever said that in public. He said that numerous times to yeah. his employees. He said it to the judge as well, didn't he? Yeah. We, we actually, in one of these Kubrick hours, we talked about a scene a, a few, couple months back in... Um, when when they bring the AE thirty five unit back into the ship, there are a couple of uh, kind of things that you can call advances. For one is three D imagery. They're, they did it. They used animation, but it looks like three D. And then there's also where he he holds this kind of it looks like a pen, and he holds it down to the circuitry, and then the screen is showing. Yes, right. which is kind of like an an MRI or or. A, a, what do you call it? That men have to get a fifty with they... oh, a prostate <laughs> prostate <laughs> uh, test. Yes, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Stoppy, something <laughs> stop it. But um, yeah, also the microwave. I mean, think about it. It's something as simple as a microwave. I mean, it's you know, and art- artificial intelligence. Of course, that was maybe yeah. the first film that covered that. Yeah. Yeah, Hall is another another icon that always comes up. I mean, in any kind of, in any Twitter discussion, Hall comes up. Yeah. You know, I've, you're right, Maria. Always, always. I've, I've had 10 year olds who say, yeah, Hal, yeah, well, okay, Hal. Okay, you know, it's like, or they're trying to do something on their computer and it's like, okay, Hal, okay. And it's like, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't do that right now. I mean, it's, it's, uh, well, anyway, Mark, I think we've. I think we've we covered it. Exhausted it, but yeah. we've covered it. Uh, you know, this has been great. This has been fantastic. Thanks for everybody's comments and, and contribution to this great, you know, to this great show. You know, kind of year end. So yes, yeah. Well, th- thanks, guys, for uh, organizing these, uh, particularly uh, Mark, who does all the uh, heavy lifting on the uh, on the kind of getting the word out and setting up the call. Fantastic, yeah. and and Nick for doing the whole schedule. Yeah. 
for doing and the research. Schedule. Definitely research. I, I thought he'd done the schedule. Is it the schedule he's done? Uh, yeah, <laughs> the schedule. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna have to loop off for a Jane Austen birthday party. Not oh. just literally. Oh, cool, Anne. Cool. Yeah. Oh, I, uh, gonna, I just want to wish everyone a very happy and healthy holiday season. Yeah. May 2021 be a year where we can see monoliths in person. Yes. All right. Absolutely, Anne. Very All right. Monoliths. Happy <laughs> holidays to you, Anne, and your KCAP. Yes, I, I did have to turn off the video because she was climbing all over me and I didn't <laughs> want to disrupt the recording. <laughs> Thanks. Have, have a good one. You yeah. too. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Right, bye. Oh, bye. Bye. Happy birthday. Merry Christmas. All right, everybody. Thank you. Bye. 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 Always good. Always good. Well, that was cooler than the other side of the pillow. <laughs> We'd like to thank all of our listeners for their continued support and every member of the Stanley Kubrick Appreciation Society on Facebook. In mere months, SCAS will be celebrating its 10-year anniversary of being the largest and coolest resource of all things Stanley-related on the Internet. As the Kubrick's Universe podcast enters its fourth year, we couldn't be more proud or more pleased to help bring the legacy of our favorite filmmaker into a new era, one which hopefully will see a much brighter and continually stream of days ahead. I'm your host, Jason Furlong, thanking you for being such an essential part of our extended family. We couldn't do this without you. In fact, we wouldn't bother. You have kept us going, lifted our spirits, and given us every reason in the universe to keep on keeping on. Every one of you who has taken the time and interest in what we love to bring you has paid it forward. And we have more great stuff in store for you than I can even begin to tell you. So hang in there. We've got so much more to come. Monolith willing. On behalf of Mark Lentz, James Marinaccio, and our producer, Stephen Rigg, thank you for listening, for being our friends. We'll see you on the other side of this slit scan, and catch up soon. Be well, everyone. Much love. It's Kubrick's universe. We just live in it. We have taken very thorough precautions in this podcast against broadcasting anything which might only be attributed to human error. These guys aren't scientists. They're making it up as they go along. Thank you for listening to the Stanley Kubrick Podcast. Come back soon. Nice talking to you. Bye. Over and out. This show comes to you from the Stanley Kubrick Appreciation Society.